day was dawning when Don Quixote quitted the inn, so happy, so gay, so exhilarated at finding himself now dubbed the knight, that his joy was like to burst his horse girths. However, recalling the advice of his host as, they, as to the requisites he ought to carry with him, especially that referring to money and shirts, he determined to go home and provide himself with all and also with the squire, for he reckoned upon securing a farm laborer, a neighbor of his, a poor man with a family, but very well qualified for the offices of squire to a knight. With this object, he turned his horse's head towards his village, and Rociante, thus reminded of his old quarters, stepped out so briskly that he hardly seemed to tread the earth. He had not gone far, when out of a thicket on his right there seemed to come feeble cries, as of someone in distress, and the instant he heard them, he exclaimed, Thanks be to heaven for the favor it accords me, that it so soon offers me an opportunity of fulfilling the obligation I have undertaken and gathering the fruit of my ambition. These cries, no doubt, come from some man or woman in want of help, and needing my aid and protection. And wheeling, he turned Rociante in the direction whence the cries seemed to proceed. He had gone but a few paces into the wood when he saw a mare tied to an oak, and tied to another, and stripped from the waist upwards, a youth of about fifteen years of age, from whom the cries came. Nor were they without cause, for a lusty farmer was flogging him with a belt and following up every blow with scoldings and commands, repeating, Your mouth shut and your eyes open, while the youth made an answer, I won't do it again, master mine, my God's passion, I won't do it again, and I'll take more care of the flock another time. Seeing what was going on, Don Quixote said in an angry voice, Discourteous knight, it ill becomes you to assail one who cannot defend himself. Mount your steed and take your lance for there was a lance leaning against the oak to which the mare was tied, and I will make you know that you are behaving as a coward. The farmer, seeing before him this figure in full armor brandishing a lance over his head, gave himself up for dead, and made an answer meekly, Sir Knight, this youth that I am chastising is my servant, employed by me to watch a flock of sheep that I have hard by, and he is so careless that I lose one every day, and when I punish him for his carelessness and knavery, he says I do it out of niggardliness to escape paying him the wages I owe. God, and on my soul, he lies. Lies before me, base clown, said Don Quixote. By the sun that shines on us, I have a mind to run you through with this lance. By him at once, without another word, if not by the God that rules us, I will make an end of you and annihilate you on the spot, releasing him instantly. The farmer hung his head, and without a word, untied his servant, of whom Don Quixote asked how much his master owed him. He replied, nine months at seven reels a month. Don Quixote added it up, found that it came to sixty-three reels, and told the farmer to pay it down immediately, if he did not want to die for it. The trembling clown replied that, as he lived and by the oath he had sworn, though he had not sworn any, it was not so much. For there were to be taken into account and deducted three pairs of shoes he had given him, and a reel for two bloodlettings when he was sick. All that is very well, said Don Quixote, but let the shoes and the bloodlettings stand as set off against the blows you have given him without any cause, for if you spilled the leather of the shoes you paid for, you have damaged that of his body, and if the barber took his blood from him when he was sick, you have drawn it when he was sound, so on the score he owes you nothing. The difficulty is, Sir Knight, that I have no money here. Let Andreas come home with me, and I will pay him all, real by real. I go with him, said the youth. Nay, God forbid, no, Signor, not for the world. For once alone with me, he would ray me like a Saint Bartholomew. He will do nothing of the kind, said Don Quixote. I have only to command, and he will obey me. And as he has sworn to me by the order of knighthood which he has received, I leave him free, and I guarantee the payment. Consider what you are saying, senor, said the youth. This master of mine is not a knight, nor has he received any order of knighthood, for he is Juan Haldudo, the rich of Quintanar. That matters little, replied Don Quixote. There may be Haldulo's knights. Moreover, everyone is the son of his works. That is true, said Andreas, but this master of mine, of what works is he the son, when he refuses me the wages of my sweat and labor? I do not refuse, brother Andreas, said the farmer. Be good enough to come along with me, and I swear by all the orders of knighthood there are in the world to pay you, as I have agreed, real by real, and perfumed. 
For the perfumery, I excuse you, said Don Quixote. Give it to him in reals, and I shall be satisfied and see that you do as you have sworn. If not, by the, time, the same oath, I swear to come back and hunt you out and punish you, and I shall find you through, though, though you should lie closer than a lizard. And if you desire to know it, it, who it is lays this command upon you, that you may more firmly bound to obey it, know that I am the valorous Don Quixote of La Mancha, the undoer of wrongs and injustices. And so, God be with you, and keep in mind what you have promised and sworn under those penalties that you have been already declared to you. So saying, he gave Rocinante the spur and was soon out of reach. The farmer followed him with his eyes, and when he saw that he had cleared the wood and was no longer in sight, he turned to his boy Andreas and said, Come here, my son, I want to pay you what I owe you, as that undoer of wrongs has commanded me. My oath on it, said Andreas, your worship will be well advised to obey the command of that good knight. May he live a thousand years, for as he is a valiant and just judge by Roque, if you do not pay me, he will come back and do as he said. My oath on it, too, said the farmer, but as I have a strong affection for you, I want to add to the debt in order to add to the payment. And seizing by the arm, he tied him up again and gave him such a flogging that he left him for dead. Now, Master Andreas, said the farmer, call on the undoer of wrongs. You will find he won't undo that, though I'm not sure that I have quite done with you, for I have a good mind to flay you alive. But at last he untied him and gave him leave to go look for his judge in order to put the sentence pronounced into execution. Andreas went off rather down in the mouth, swearing he would go to look for the valiant Don Quixote of La Mancha and tell him exactly what had happened and all that would have to be repaid to him sevenfold. But for all that, he went off weeping while his master stood laughing. Thus did the valiant Don Quixote right that wrong and thoroughly satisfied with what had taken place as he considered he had made a very happy and noble beginning with his knighthood he took the road towards his village in perfect self-content saying in a low voice well mayest thou this day call thyself fortunate above all on earth o dulciana del toboso fairest of the fair since it has fallen to thy lot to hold subject and submissive to thy full will and pleasure a knight so renowned as is and will be Don Quixote of La Mancha, who, as all the world knows, yesterday received the order of knighthood, and hath today righted the greatest wrong and grievance that ever injustice conceived and cruelty perpetrated, who hath today plucked the rod from the hand of yonder ruthless oppressor, so wantonly lashing that tender child. He now came to a road branching in four directions, and immediately he was reminded of those cross roads where knights errants used to stop to consider which road they should take. In imitation of them, he halted for a while, and after having deeply considered it, he gave Rossignate his head, submitting his own will to that of his hack, who followed out his first intention, which was to make straight for his own stable. After he had gone about two miles, Don Quixote perceived a large party of people who, as afterwards appeared, were some Toledo traders on their way to buy silk at Mercia. There were six of them coming along under their sunshades, with four servants mounted and three muleteers on foot. Scarcely had Don Quixote to describe them when a fancy possessed him that this must be some new adventure, and to help him to imitate as far as he could those passages he had read in his books, here seems to come one made on purpose, which he resolved to attempt. So with a lofty bearing and determination, he fixed himself firmly in his stirrups, got his lance ready, brought his buckler before his breast, and planting himself in the middle of the road, stood waiting the, the approach of these knights errant. For such he now considered and held them to be, and when they had come near enough to see and hear, he exclaimed with a haughty gesture, All the world stand, unless all the world confess that in all the world there is no maiden fairer than the Empress of La Mancha, the peerless Delciana del Toboso. The traders halted at the sound of this language and the sight of the strange figure that uttered it, and from both figure and language at once guessed the craze of their owner. They wished, however, to learn quietly what the object of this confession that was demanded of them, and one of them, who was rather fond of a joke and was very sharp-witted, said to him, Sir Knight, we do not know who this good lady is that you speak of. Show her to us, for if she be of such beauty as you suggest, with all our hearts and without any pressure, we will confess the truth that is on your part required of us. If I were sh to show her to you, replied Don Quixote, what merit would you have in confessing a truth so point is that without seeing her you must believe confess affirm swear and defend it else ye 
to do with me in battle, ill-conditioned, arrogant rabble that ye are, and come ye on one by one as the order of knighthood requires, or altogether as is the custom and vile usage of your breed. Here I do bide and await you, relying on the justice of the cause I maintain. Sir Knight, replied the traitor, I entreat your worship in the name of this present company of princes, that to save us from charging our consciousnesses with confession of a thing we have never seen or heard of, and one moreover so to the prejudice of the empress and queens of the Alcaria and Estremadura, your worship will be pleased to show us some portrait of the lady, though it be no bigger than a grain of wheat, for by the thread one gets at the ball, and in this way we shall be satisfied and easy, and you will be content and pleased. Nay, I believe we are already so far agreed with you that even though her portrait should show her blind in one eye and distilling from the other, we would nevertheless, to gratify your worship, say all in her favor that you desire. She distills nothing of the kind, vile rabble, said Don Quixote, burning with rage. Nothing of the kind, I say, only ambergris and civet and cotton, nor is she one-eyed nor humpbacked, but straighter than a garderama spindle. But ye must pay for the blasphemy ye have uttered against beauty like that of my lady. And so saying, he charged with one with leveled lance against the one who had spoken with such fury and fierceness that if luck had not contrived that Rocinante should stumble midway and come down, it would have gone hard with the rash traitor. Down went Rocinante, and over went his master, rolling along on the ground for some distance, and when he tried to rise, he was unable, so encumbered was he with the lance, buckler, spurs, helmet, and weight of his old armor. And all the while he was struggling to get up, he kept saying, Fly not, cowards and caitiffs, Stay, for not by my fault, but my horses am I stretched here. One of the muleteers and attendants, who could not have much good nature in him, hearing the poor prostrate man blustering in his style, was unable to refrain from giving him an answer on his ribs, and coming up to him, seizing his lance, and having broken it into pieces with one of them, he began so to belabor our Don Quixote that notwithstanding, and in spite of his armor, he milled him like a measure of wheat. His master is called out not to lay on so hard and to leave him alone, but the muleteer's blood was up, and he did not care to drop the game until he had vented the rest of his wrath and gathered up the remaining fragments of the lance he finished with the discharge upon the unhappy victim, who, all through the storm of sticks that rained on him, never ceased threatening heaven and earth and the brigands for such they seemed to him. At last the muleteer was tired, and the traders continued their journey, taking with them matter for talk about the poor fellow who had been cudgeled. He, when he found himself alone, made another effort to rise, but if he was unable, when whole and sound, how was he to rise after having been thrashed so and so well nigh knocked to pieces? And yet he esteemed himself fortunate, as it seemed to him that this was a regular knight errant's mishap, and entirely he considered the fault of his horse. However battered in body he was to rise, to rise was beyond his power.